Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Lynn Patrick. I'm here with my good friend, Dr. Andrew Campbell. Uh, we are graced with his presence this evening so that we can talk about uh, evidence-based medicine and mycotoxin testing. Um, Dr. Campbell is going to be uh, one of our presenters at EHS 2020. He's going to be talking about serum mycotoxin uh, antibody testing, uh, as well one of his um, longtime associates and research colleagues, Dr. Aristo Vojdani, will also be speaking on immunotoxicity um, related to toxicant exposure. This is going to be a very exciting conference because we're really going to get to drill down into um, what I call making the invisible visible, all the toxicants that we're exposed to that actually are altering our immunity and making us more susceptible to these chronic infections that we now see as epidemics in our uh, complex patient population. So welcome, Dr. Campbell. I'm so Thank excited you. to have you. I'm so you have, a, you have a long history of working in this area for many decades. You also have a long history of being a brilliant researcher and publishing. And I just want to tell everyone that at the uh, My Myco Lab website uh, is a list of Dr. Campbell's. He's published 90 research papers, and um, I, th I think a good deal of them, 30 at least, are on mold and mycotoxins. And they're not only brilliant patient cases, but actual uh, deep dives into the pathology of mycotoxin-related disease. So there's an education there, uh, and, and please take advantage of that. So let's get started with uh, your history uh, as a clinician, working with patients with uh, everything from breast implant related mycotoxicosis to water damage building mycotoxicosis and the testing that you use. I believe you worked with Dr. Vajdani when he had immunosciences laboratory. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. What we did was um, I had met him 31 years ago, 89, and um, I, 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 I didn't meet him, I'm, I found out about his lab. And then what happened is I started seeing a lot of women who had young, old, um, all sizes, uh, et cetera, who had similar clinical pictures, uh, similar complaints, et cetera. Back in the days before computers and all this kind of stuff that keep track. So I stayed late. Uh, keeping looking at my charts. What do these women have in common? What, what's the commonality between this 54-year-old, 64-year-old, 44-year-old, and 24-year-old that they have the exact same symptoms? I came up with one glaring conclusion, and that was that they had silicone breast implants. Mm -hmm. I called Dr. Vishdani and spoke to him in Los Angeles. This was, I was in Houston. And I said, is there a test I can use? He says, let me, let, me, let me fix something up. And so we started testing these women. They turned out positive. And then we published our finding. And when we published our findings, along with, several, I mean, a group of us, but especially Dr. Rajdani and I, um, several papers on, on silicone dimethylpolysiloxane, as it is called, and the effects on the immune system, autoimmunity, um, chronic disorders as per that. Then one day, Connie Chung gets on national TV. She says, I finally found out what's causing my problems. It's this guy in Houston that found out this and this. And then I started seeing breast implants. But here's the key to this. Most women, plastic surgeons are taught how to put these in, but not how to remove them. Mm -hmm. and, and although many of these women opted for removal, they didn't get better much maybe 20%, and I was wondering, why aren't they well now? The toxicity has been out and gone. They were explanted, correct? They were explanted. And, and replaced with a saline implant? Nope. With no implant. No implant. So I found this guy, Dr. Pierre Blay, PhD, in Montreal, Canada, B-L-A-I-S. And I call, I was educated in Switzerland. French was my major language, so I spoke to him in French invite him down to Houston, he comes, I said, what do you see in implants when they're removed and they're still intact? He says, well, they're discolored. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, new ones are kind of an icy blue. These ones are, have all kinds of flecks floating around them, uh, green, brown, black, 
uh, yellow, orange. And I said, where are they? He says, they're molds. I said, well, how'd the mold get into the implant? He says, manufacturing process was very poor because these implants were grandfathered in by the FDA. There was no standard way to make them. So people made them however they wanted to. So then I started helping them with, with their fungal infection and they got much better. And then what happened is pa patients talk and they said, you know, my sister, mother, aunt, grandmother was here and you helped her with her mold problem from her implants. Can you help us with our mold implant, our mold, because we have it in our home. So then I started investigating all that. Houston has two great medical schools and a great medical library back then, no internet again. So I went down there, spent my Saturdays and Sundays at the library looking these things up. Again, published papers with Dr. Brizdani, and, uh, 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 and, and then I started publishing papers with uh, uh, Dr. Gunnar Heuser and, and Michael Gray, et cetera, a, a whole bunch of us that were interested in this field and area that were making patients ill in a chronic manner. And this is all about toxicity. So mm -hmm. then I got into the molds and then I found out, well, well, molds are the gun. The bullet are the mycotoxins. That's what's really right. making the mill. And of course the NIH agreed. I even went up to the, the NIH invited me, I'm sorry, to discuss this at, at one of their meetings, et cetera, um, in, in just outside of Washington. Uh, and so, they never did anything about it until years later then they put a moratorium on breast implants and we told them back then dr burjdani and i showed how these decrease nk cell activity and can be a precursor for certain kinds of cancers well finally last year they admitted that although that was mm -hmm. back 93 94 that we presented this and published it so, so to, to be clear the because um, I was working with Dr. Vojdani when he was working on the breast implants. We just hadn't met each other yet. You were looking at anti-silicone antibodies. And then at some point, did you start looking at uh, anti-mold antibodies and anti-mycotoxin antibodies back then in the breast correct. implant women? That's exactly correct. And so Dr. Vojdani's lab had a panel. And I ordered these panels. And sure enough, they lit up. As a matter of fact, in his latest book about food autoimmunities that came mm -hmm. out last year. He has this, he writes a page about me and what happened and all that and, and how he had to find out, well, who is this guy in Houston? So yes, and that's how it all started. And then I found that, okay, molds are, are inflammatory, but really what makes the immune system, we did T cell, B cell uh, uh, studies, we did uh, stimulation studies. We did NK cell activity studies. We just didn't go how many T cells and B cells do they have and how many NK cells. No. If stimulated, were they overstimulated, understimulated? Were they excited? Were they unexcited? How was the immune system reacting? And that's what made the, that's what gave us the important data, the immunotoxicity of, of these first silicone and then of mycotoxins. And then uh, you know, for various reasons, uh, that that stopped. So we, I kept on. I saw, gee, almost about thirteen thousand patients with mycotoxin toxicity and treated them. And the, the beauty of it is, is that um, we kept publishing this. And not only me, but me and and colleagues that we were all working together in this field, so that other doctors can find out about it and other doctors can apply what we learned in their patients. And that's the purpose. So, and those greats, and I wanna you know, just acknowledge you as one of the pioneers of environmental medicine because you have been doing this for 30, 40 years. Um, you published with them. So as I said, for those of you that are just joining us, if you go to my Mycotoxin Lab website and to the physician's dropdown, uh, you'll see all of Dr. Campbell's papers and, and please read them because the case studies are, you know, uh, demyelinating disorders, uh, acoustic neuromas, you know, just at a plethora of uh, conditions that are related to mycotoxin exposure. So I want to bring you to the present. Um, so now, as you probably know, there is a huge debate about what's the best test to use for mold exposed patients. 
And I would like to hear from your perspective what you think about your test, which is the IgE, IgG uh, serum uh, mycotoxin antibody test uh, in comparison to uh, everything else that's out there. And, okay. you know, yeah. and, yeah. and what, you see, what you see in patients who are chronically exposed, who have a past history of chronic exposure, and who are currently exposed. Because that's really what we can't tell apart, right? I agree. And uh, for a period of time, there was no mycotoxin testing available anymore. And then a urine test came out, and I said, well, at least we have something. But reading up on it, the issue with urine mycotoxin, you're not testing for mycotoxins. You're testing for their metabolites. Mm -hmm. And also, it's an excretion, CDC. NIH, World Health Organization, U.S. Department of Agriculture, all these people say that at least 25% of our crops have mycotoxins, especially anything with bean, corn, coffee, um, wheat, all those crops. So when you have in your urine mycotoxins, it's a good thing. You're getting rid. It's an excretion. Thank your, you. Your body is getting rid of something it has, but it has nothing to do with body burden. It's only telling you, and at that point in time, you are getting rid of this much, and it's parts per billion, the same amount that the, all these government departments say is in the food. So you're getting, but it doesn't say anything about you. And Dr. Rajdani and I looked at this very carefully, and one of the things that these antibodies, serum antibodies, IgG and IgE, antibodies to mycotoxins, what they do is they form adducts. And these adducts can bind to human tissue. And when they bind to human tissue, they cause auto, they trigger autoimmunity. And also when you have DNA adducts formed by these, what does that do? That's the precursor for cancers and things right. of that nature, which urine test doesn't, doesn't tell you. So if you have a patient and it's been exposed and you're a year later they come down with a cancer, oops. Or they come down with one of the autoimmune disorders, oops. You had no idea, you couldn't find out. So the big advantage is one, it is you're testing for the actual mycotoxin, not, it, not a metabolite. So and can I back up just a tiny bit because this is a crucial question that you know, I went to the ICI conference, which is the group of uh, doctors who treat mold, amazing conference. But one of the main conversations was, how can we differentiate exposure to water damaged building mold versus food mold? And I would like your wisdom on that subject because um, as you said, finding urine mycotoxins in mold how can we know whether that's food related or not? Because that's what, you, what you're excreting. That's what you're supposed to be doing from the food. But if you're looking at an illness and you're looking for pathology, pathology is defined by the antibodies you are producing. And that's mm -hmm. a big difference. For instance, another example is ochratoxin. Ochratoxin is 99.8% bound to human albumin. How can you excrete it? You can't. It's reabsorbed completely by both passive and active methods from the kidneys. So how can you have ochratoxin in the urine? And le well, wouldn't you have it in the bile? Wouldn't it be excreted uh, biliary route then if it's bound to albumin? No? No. It You're just keeps getting recycled. No, it's going to get recycled. There's, again, I'm, I'm basing all this on evidence, um, mm -hmm. evidence-based. So on ev based on evidence, you do not excrete through the urine or protoxin. Mm. Fascinating. Yes. And I got a call from a doctor, I think it was Minnesota or Ohio, who said, every patient I've tested, I've looked at the last 10, and all 10 of them have ochratoxin in their urine. I said, so I said, what does that tell you? He says, well, I went back and looked back and almost all the time there's ochratoxin. How can that be? It's 99.8% bound. So it's 
you cannot excrete it. And there's paper after paper of studies of studies that are published. Just look it up in PubMed. And by the way, it's also um, included on, on several of my papers because I discuss herpetoxin. So to be clear, if laboratories are saying that they are measuring ochratoxins in urine, are they measuring uh, something that's metabolically identical or similar enough that it's looking like ochratoxin? I have no idea because these are metabolites. They're not ochratoxin. They don't measure yeah. any of the mycotoxins. They only measure metabolites of mycotoxins. The only true measurement of mycotoxin and the true measurement of body burden of a substance is through IgG and IgE antibody testing. Okay, so let's talk about that because this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. In someone who has um, IgG mycotoxin, how long ago could they have been exposed to a mycotoxin and would they of necessity have to be re-exposed to keep producing those IgG antibodies? That's a very good question. I get asked that a lot, emails, et cetera, at conferences when I speak and questions at the end. And the answer to that is that usually when exposure stops, your antibodies continue at a certain level and then they start to fade, 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 fade. So if a person has very high levels, then it means they're currently or just very recently they were exposed. However, if they have relatively low moderate to low levels, then it could be on the way out because they're exposed a couple of years back or three years back. Also, the most important question you can ask any patient is, how do you feel? If they say, doc, I feel awful. I have all these symptoms. I've been to so many doctors and they've done all these tests and they can't find anything wrong with me. Well, guess what? That's the one you do an any, a, a, a mycotoxin antibody testing. But if they feel fine, don't test them for anything. So it, do you ever do a total IgG to see if their total IgG, if you get a low IgG, I know I'm drilling down a little prematurely here, but if you get a low IgG mycotoxin, you, do you, you ever look at total IgG? Still going to make antibodies. You can't not. Uh, unless you have no IgG and then you're a bubble yeah. boy, uh, right. uh, even low IgG. And I routinely test IgG, but also don't forget when you test for I total IgG, test for the four IgG subclasses, one, two, three. Right. That's always important. But um, that is more to see if they're going to have a reaction to um, antibodies to uh, neural tissues and other and autoimmunity, et cetera, et cetera. So I always measure that afterwards or measure it in the beginning, it doesn't matter. But the point is, is that you, the, the IgGs are gonna be there even if they have, they're kind of on the low side of IgG. One of the questions I get asked a lot is, well, this patient has had Lyme and their immune system is, de is, is depressed or depressed or et cetera. How can they have antibodies? You're gonna make antibodies. You have to, that's how the immune system works. Even if you're very low, very sick, you're still gonna make antibodies. Yeah. Now, the only time you don't, you have to, you can't measure antibodies is if you're on an immune suppressant drug, prednisone, right. cortisone, uh, cancer, <clears throat> et cetera, that suppress your immune system on purpose, you can't test. You know, um, I know that you're concentrating on, uh, you know, uh, your train of thought here. But there are, there's a quite an active group in the chat room. Um, and this, this okra toxin issue, it, we're not going to be able to let it go. And so I think at some point, I, I would love you to uh, further enlighten us about okra toxin and urine okra toxin. Um, so uh, I'm wondering if, you know, we can't belabor the point here but maybe we can at EHS have an expanded conversation about this because all the mold doctors are saying, you know, I see it all the time in the urine and there's tons of studies on animals in the literature and um, it, I, I see it all the time. Yeah. I so, I so at and this I moment, let's agree to disagree. 
and, okay. uh, and agree to commit ourselves to further educating ourselves about this with your guidance. How about that? As you can point us to some. Really all I say is read the medical literature. Yeah. So what you and I will get together, we'll get some stuff together for EHS. How about that? And we can have a really well-educated conversation about it. Um, because I think we, we all are trying to learn about this, you know, it's, uh, we're all kind of in the weeds about it. So talk about how you would utilize antibody testing for mycotoxins in the actual uh, evaluation, in the diagnosis, and in the treatment of patients who are mold and mycotoxin exposed. Usually patients that come see me have already been to see a lot of docs. And then some, somehow, somewhere along the line, and you wouldn't believe how many doctors I see and their families. Um, so somewhere along the line, uh, someone said, did you read this or did you see this on YouTube or something of that nature? And then they end up coming to see me and they show me all their tests. They, I require them to bring everything they have for the last couple, three years. I look at all of it and evaluate them. And I have to examine the patient. I, um, I sometimes occasionally find a patient that I say, I don't think you have mold issues. I don't think mycotoxin is your problem. I think you probably have this and this and this. And, you know, I tell them that. But in general, patients come to me already kind of primed by their physicians that this is who you need to go see. They've usually watched one of my video clips on YouTube. They've, us, their doctors have read something that I've published, so on and so forth. And that's how they get to me. And then I examine them. Uh, you have to do a very, uh, my new patient's exams are at least a couple hours long because just the neurological part takes a while. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you just can't do this 10, 15 minute exam. You have to be thorough with these people. They've been, they're kind of afraid. Um, they've been to doctors, they've been disillusioned by medicine. They've taken tons of treatment, some of it either allopathic and then other treatments uh, with other, various other ways of treating and it hasn't worked. And so they come to you frightened, nervous, not feeling well at all. And our duty as clinicians is to do our best to help. So how, how in that patient, let's say chronic complex illness, prior treatment, possibly <clears throat> not responding, how do you use, I'm really going to try and kind of focus on IgE, IgG antibody testing here for mycotoxins. How do you use that tool to assess their current exposure and also their current response to whatever they're exposed to. Does that make sense? Sure. Well, so the panel of tests is 24, is 24 tests. It's 12 mycotoxins for IgG antibodies and 12 mycotoxins for IgE antibodies. And I run, the test is run at the lab, and then I look at the results, and the re results are normal, low, moderate, or high. And if they show up high with two or three, or moderately high in, in a two or three or whatever or more, then I say, okay, there's an issue here. And that's how I decide. Now, if they show up and everything is normal, which is highly unusual in, in the patients I see, although some other doctors send patients and they're trying to rule out things and they send patients who have very low levels uh, mostly, and which tells me they were exposed a while back, not anymore, and they're not. This is not really affecting them. But in my patients, they they come to me because they're not feeling well. They're sick. They're ill. Um, and then I order the test, and I look at the tests, and then start treatment. The first rule of toxicology is very simple: it's mm -hmm. the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. The other part is you've got to look at their environment. If they're living at the crossroad of two major highways and and breathing all those fumes, et cetera, are they, you know, do they, what about pesticide exposure? What about VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds? What about heavy metals? You've got to look at the whole picture mm -hmm. and see what that patient is exposed to, and you've got to minimize their environmental exposure. Remember, this is the Environmental Health Symposium. 
environmental health, <laughs> the environment they're living in is essential to your health. That, that either creates good health or you have lousy health, depending on your environment. And that's what we're going to listen to great speakers at the conference. So the second thing is it doesn't matter what treatment they get. If they're still exposed, they will not get better. Yes. And I, I think, um, Dr. Campbell, I think most of the, the attendees here uh, are astute clinicians who've been practicing for a while and who concentrate on mold patients. Um, and, and that brings up another question is how do you see the intersection of uh, room air mycotoxin testing as um, a part of the workup that includes looking at blood antibody testing? You know, um, a lot of patients come and bring in a report from some testing company that tested their home, et cetera. And the industry, that whole industry of, of testing mm -hmm. the, the business, the workplace, has no standards. You know, you get five bids, you'll have five different stories. Right. So um, you have to kind of do your own work and say, let me ask you, have you, did you have a leak? Some people would say, oh yeah, we went, we went skiing in Colorado and when we got back to our home, some pipe has burst and there was a foot of water all over the place. You know? But other times it's, and the EPA tells you this, 50% of the time you don't see it. Why? It's behind walls. Maybe you, you put a picture up and knocked a nail in and, and unbeknownst to you in the back behind that wall, there was a, you know, a PVC pipe and you knocked a tiny little hole in it and that's been leaking. How often do people pull out their refrigerator and look at the hookup for their, their ice machine and water and see if there might be a leak behind there? What about behind your dishwasher or, or behind your washer and dryer? Nobody looks, looks back there and there could be leaks. And of course, then there's the bathrooms where a lot of this happens because right. Bathrooms are not built very carefully, shall we say. And they, unless they are, a lot of times, and I've seen people who come to see me who live in large custom-built homes, and, uh, and the bathroom is, is where they, the shower or whatever, uh, is the culprit. We're all vulnerable. That's the point, right? Regardless of how many square feet we live in. Certainly. Doesn't, doesn't matter. So and, we actually, um, Dr. Campbell, we actually had uh, an entire um, EHS on this subject in 2016. So we had building biologists and industrial hyg hygienists come and give talks about um, ways to do this, you know, that are uh, better verified than others, certainly. And what was interesting to me is uh, we had someone who actually wrote some of the industrial standards and he did testing in a living air, in several living true homes that were mold exposed. And one of the highest sources of uh, spore counts was the couch in the yeah. living room, yeah. which was kind of surprising to all of us in the audience. Um, but getting back to testing, because we know, and I know this from doing your urine mycotoxin testing, the more toxic the person, the more acute the exposure, the more unable they are to eliminate the mycotoxins in their urine. So we'll get sick people who have, had, who have zero mycotoxins in their urine who won't be able to eliminate those mycotoxins until they are removed from the home. Yes, and they correct. do start a protocol uh, to um, assist them immunologically and uh, you know, in, in terms of their ability to both process these mycotoxins in the liver and the kidneys. So in that situation, how do you find blood antibody testing helpful? Let's I just take that, that situation, acute exposure. It's very helpful because first of all, you're gonna see what mycotoxins this patient is carrying in their blood and that's their body burden as well. And then you have to worry about whether they're forming adducts. So if they have several high levels, I would recommend, and uh, I recommend to these people to have an autoimmune panel done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a question in here about the Cyrex uh, yes, right. pathogen panel. 
No, I use the, I use their, uh, they call it Array 5, I believe. It's their autoimmune panel. Okay, Array that 5. That covers that whole spectrum. And you wouldn't believe how many positives I have. And here's something else that's interesting, is that in treating these patients who have, okay, so you get these patients, they have high levels of mycotoxins, the first step, you got to get them out from the exposure. And let's say they do that and, and they're away from the exposure. They still feel terrible. They still feel terrible five months later. Some, some of them actually say, well, I'm going to leave and then I think I'll feel better. And then they come mm. back two, three, four, four or five months later and they're sick. And you tell them, okay, now we, we can start treating you. And the other part of it, of, of this picture is you've got to help build up their immune system because their immune system is out of whack, it's dysregulated by these mycotoxins, which are very right. potent uh, protein synthesis inhibitors. Again, if you're, sin if you're binding to human tissue, you've got to look at the effects of that. Remember, these are carcinogenic, you know, they're neurotoxic, hepatotoxic, um, et cetera, and, and the papers discuss this at, you know, ad infinitum. So um, that's where you really get this as a helpful tool. Then some people say, okay, I'm going to start treatment and retest in two months. Don't do that. Don't, don't retest in two months. Give the immune system a chance. Give it six months, five to six months, and then retest. Don't retest right away. And remember, never test anyone that's on an immunosuppressive drug. Right. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, and that's a conundrum for some because some of these patients already have developed an autoimmune disease and are on some sort of immunosuppressive drug. So speaking of treatment, um, I know having been given the benefit of your wisdom uh, and your sound medical advice that you have a lot of uh, experience using antifungals in the treatment of mycotoxin exposed patients. Could you talk about that? Because there's there's also a little bit of controversy about the appropriate use of antifungals in patients who've been mycotoxin exposed or okay. mold exposed. Uh, at the risk of being repetitive, I go by the evidence. <laughs> and so the evidence shows clearly it's not an opinion. And back uh, 20 years ago, you had to go by evidence. There, there was no conferences and things like that 30 years ago. So the point is you've got to start where is 80% of the immune system? It's in the gut. So you start with a good probiotic. Now you've got to be a little judicious in your use of probiotics because the University of Reading in London published a study on probiotics in which they found that about 90% or more of lactobacilli and bifidobacterium are killed by stomach mm. acids. That's right. the immune system. So you've got to use spore-based, um, mm -hmm. spore-forming bacteria, and not these because they may not make, make it through. So right. you start with the gut. Um, a, a lot of people, you love cholestyramine, but the problem is, is that you can't use it in patients who take hormones of any kind. If you're hypothyroid, um, if, you've got, if you're diabetic, you can't take this. And cholestyramine binds everything. It, right. It's been bad. So use something very simple and cheap. Activated charcoal. <laughs> it's been around since before sliced bread. And it works great. And it doesn't have any of that other stuff. So I'm very careful with what I put in my patients' guts. Because, again, it's what 80% of the immune system is. The other part is using an antifungal. Initially, I was hesitant. Uh, to use itraconazole, which is Spornox, 100 milligram mm. PID. Well, because it's, you know, it can affect your liver, et cetera. In the beginning, I checked livers, liver function tests every right. two weeks. Nothing happened. They stayed fine. So I started checking it every month, once a month. They still stayed fine. So I started checking it every six weeks. It's still fine. And in almost 14,000 patients, not quite. I had one adverse reaction and it was a lady who came in saying, I'm not sleeping. I'm, I'm up all night. I cannot mm. sleep. And it's one of the 
insomnias on that long list of possible side effects. Interesting. I took her, I took Spornox away the next night. She slept like a baby and so on and so forth. So if you're going, if you're a clinician and are going to use Spornox, I can attest that in my patients, it was fine. And when you start using that, they will get better. The other part is we have to remember that one of the places that mycotoxins really attack is the central and peripheral nervous system. And there's been a lot of studies published about that, how they cause demyelination. Right. And in fact, one of the, one of the major causes, they, one of the problems they cause is it was called CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. Big one. CIDP is a lot better and shorter. So these patients develop CIDP. And so what I did is, is I had a doctor come, a neurologist. I contacted him. He was up at Duke. He had an MD and a PhD, and he was a board-certified neurologist. And I had him read nerve conduction velocities. I didn't do EMGs because an EMG, once you do an EMG, that picks up only once you have 20% of demyelination on and more. But what happens if you have 10 or 15 or 5% mm -hmm. to pick it up? But if you do nerve conduction studies, they pick up at, at under 5%. And so I'd send these re reports with all these squiggly lines to this neurologist who'd come and he'd call me. He says, where are you getting all these CIDB, CIDP patients? And I said, well, they're, you know, I'm testing them there for mycotoxins. Finally, he came down once to mm. and, and, and um, I said, what's the, he said, there's three treatments for that. One is plasmapheresis, where you take the blood out of one end, put it through a machine, and get it back at the other. It, that, that don't recommend it. The two, second one is high doses of prednisone. You don't want that. The third one is intravenous gamma globulin, which okay. works best. 0 0.4 grams per kilo per dose, once a week over six weeks. So that's, again, we, we published several, several, several studies looking at that. And that's one of the areas that, that mycotoxins really, really hit hard, the brain and the central nervous system. This is why it's important to do a very thorough neurological exam on your patients and make sure you have a very thorough questionnaire. Look, they have short-term memory loss, headaches like they've never had before, tremors. They have numbness and tingling, muscle weakness. They have sleep disturbance, anxiety, depression. All these things are in the brain and the peripheral nervous system. So this is why you've got to be very thorough. And this is why this test for antibodies tells me, oh, wow, look, they're high. I need to go and now do these other things. And so, that, so it's the trigger for you to know you have to be more aggressive. Correct. With your treatment. Got it. Correct. Thank you. It helped me, it guides me as to what other tests I need and what treatment I need to do. Great. So I don't want, you let, I don't want to let you off the hook, though, about um, itraconazole. So we're assuming that the immune suppression of these mycotoxins is triggering an, um, either overgrowth of some uh, kind of otherwise benign mold or fungus or an infection of a fungus that shouldn't be there in the first place. Am I off here? You're, uh, no, you're on the right track. What happens is, is that, and just to put sizes to, the, uh, to look at sizes, hair is 100 microns. Mold spores are about approximately 10. Mycotoxins are 0 0.1 microns. Mm. So when you're around, um, all you need is in your vent, air conditioning vent or air conditioning system is one ball of mold the size of a cotton ball. And that's constantly releasing mold spores. And those mold spores are carrying mycotoxins and you're breathing them. And they're going into your lungs. They're going where, wherever they want. In your nose, they get through the cribiform plate and go right into the, the, the um, hypothalamic axis pituitary axis and affect the brain, etc. So you've got to kill the source where the mycotoxins are coming from. And by killing the spores, the mold spores, you, 
and you get rid, you're slowly giving, getting rid of the source of mycotoxins. Then you strengthen the immune system. And by strengthening the immune system, your own immune system starts fighting again, finally, and starts getting rid of stuff and helping you get better. So treatment, like for instance, it's important to take zinc. Why? Because that's the number one mineral of the immune system. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's well established. Make sure you have coenzyme Q10 in, in you. Make sure that everything else is okay. You've got to, I, I prefer to use natural anti-inflammatories, anti fish oils, good fish oil source, et cetera, than use a medication. The only medication I'll, I'll use essentially in these patients is ibuprofen. Thank you for that. Um, because I, I, that was never made clear to me. I mean, I, I used to treat AIDS patients and used antifungals for years. Never in my AIDS patients had elevations of liver enzymes using antifungals. So I don't know where that's coming from. I never saw it. And these were really sick humans. So we've got um, a good number of questions. I don't know if you want to run through them and hit on any. Um. Let's see, there was one. Um, uh, the mold, there's one from Cyrax. Do your, do your results uh, tend to correlate with mold antibody markers? Well, molds are one thing, and mycotoxins are another thing. It, 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 the one it doesn't equal the other. The other important point to remember here among everybody is that one mold produces a series of mycotoxins. It's right. not one mold produces one mycotoxin. So you can't correlate those, those mm -hmm. two. Mm -hmm. um, Important point. Uh, are fermented foods a good source of probiotics? Absolutely. Gosh, you know, think of countries where they eat in the, in the Far East, kimchi, in, in old Europe, uh, sauerkraut, all those kind of foods. And if you make it yourself, which is not hard to do at all, they're very good. Very great source of probiotics for you. You know, um, Andrew, there's a question here about adaptogenic mushrooms being avoided with mold. And it leads me to think about, you know, I'm on the ICI uh, member e-list and there's an ongoing controversy about low mold diet. Do you have your patients, which has been your experience with taking them uh, off of quote unquote moldy food, foods that tend to be, you know, carry mold residues? I, okay, these patients have a delicate, very delicate immune system. So I don't want to expose them to anything. Remember in the beginning, we talked about environmental exposures. That includes what you eat. That includes foods. I mean, blue cheese, Roquefort, all, all those things. I mean, think of those. Think of uh, soy sauce, you know, all those kind of things. Do your patients a favor, have them eat as close as they can organically. Uh, make sure they, took, they take vitamin D3, glutathione if you think it's necessary, both orally or if you think IV would help them better, then give them the IV if you're experiencing that. Make sure they take some NAC, N-acetylcysteine, magnesium, the omega-3s. Make sure they're taking that food and chewing it thoroughly, because the longer you chew that food, the more it breaks it down and makes it easier to digest and get the nutrients out of the food. And fortunately, I have a lot of naturopathic doctors that send me samples, and they're very good at helping patients with, with that. So was that, was that a yes or a no for a low mold diet? Yes, I, I would recommend, I would prefer to say no mold diet. <laughs> If so, I mean, as much so what's do you have do you have a handout what are you, what are the things that you absolutely want out of their diets i i have um yes i have a list and i say eat as much as you want of this i make it simple because people i don't want to give them have three teaspoons of this and two two ounces of that and all that no i just say don't eat any of this and eat all you want of this other it's easier on patients and you have a handout. I'm just trying to get really clinically useful information for our attendees. Sure. 
Um, oh, by the way, if, if you can have a source, somebody who has an infrared sauna, that's great for getting it out of the skin. The skin is the largest organ of the body, getting rid of all toxins through the skin. Uh, the ones that are going to be discussed at EHS, environmental health. We're so affected by our environment these days. Yeah, you know, we're going to talk about some of the toxicants like uh, I know you are familiar with triclosan and triclocarban, which is in 2,000 consumer products right now. We're going to have an immunologist talk about the effect of triclosan. Uh, not only is it carcinogenic, but it's a biocide. It's immunotoxic. It's yes. in your cutting boards. It's in your clothing. It's in your socks. It's in everywhere. So yeah, we're going to go into this in more depth than probably most people want us to, but you know, that's our job. Um, but I'll tell you something else that I read a, this fabulous paper years ago about what food is wrapped in. Yeah. By a gentleman by the name of Walter Crinian. Yeah. My gosh, that opened my eyes. I had to find out who this guy was. <laughs> because that was a, no one thinks of that. What about the tubing when you go to Starbucks and get your stuff? What, what's in that tubing? You know, that when you go, again, it's, it's wrapped. What's yeah. it wrapped in? Yeah, they're now allowing perfluorinates. You know, the perfluorinates are legally allowed to be put in food uh, wrapping materials, it, cereal boxes, etc. Can legally have perfluorinates in them. So uh, let's see, Cyrex 12 to get your IgG values. It's 12, it's a the panel is 24 tests, 12 IgG and 12 IgE tests. Yeah, but I think what they're referring to is Cyrex array, oh. uh, array 12 to get your IgG values. Um, th this, Mary, uh, I know this is your question, so you may wanna clarify by chat if you, if you okay. want. So let's clarify about laboratories because I see a question about LabCorp and Cyrex. Okay. One of the things I learned about laboratory tests that I never knew before is it's very important what the methodology used for lab testing is. I was trained allopathically. I wanted a CBC with diff or a SMAC panel or whatever. I just wrote it. I had no idea how they did it. Well, I actually know how these tests are run. I don't want anything, um, and, and I'm not disparaging anyone, but I don't want anything from Quest or LabCorp. I want something from a, an absolutely well-established laboratory, and one right. of the best ones is Cyrex. I, I, I have no, I don't have any ties. I send blood to them, yes, and I have to pay them for the blood, but I have no financial or any other kind of arrangement. But they yeah, so, <clears throat> so Dr. Ackerley just clarified that she was talking about the Cyrex Array 12. I'm not sure what that array has in it, but I know that, for example, in my patients who may be neurotoxic, I use their 7X. And remember, things start in the gut, and if you get a leaky gut, that starts and triggers inflammation all over the body. So that's where you go with the Cyrex. I think it's called 2, mm -hmm. you know, um, et cetera. Again, I'm, I, I don't know all the panels by heart, except the ones that I tend to use more than any others. Okay, uh, uh, we'll get Mary to clarify if she wants to talk about what's in that panel. She can just- Sure, and you can, the... all, all of you can email me and I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Campbell's email is it the, if you just uh, scroll up to the top of the chat, it's a Campbell at mymycolab.com. So he is generously offered to entertain questions um, if we don't get to all your questions, uh, we're going to give him a transcript of the ones he wasn't able to get to. Um, boy, I'm going to go to the Q&A now, Andy, because there's some questions in there. Um, how can you be sure that mycotoxin antibodies are not due to the patient's regular diet? I know we covered this, but okay, we apparently the questions. message didn't get across. Questions are not living. Very good, that's right, they're toxins. They're not fungi or any other living or viruses or bacteria, they're toxins and that's why they're highly toxic. They're, they're known to cause, they're carcinogenic, they're known carcinogens. They're not supposed carcinogens. The American Cancer Society publishes this. So yeah, they're toxic, they're very toxic. And so, uh, the, Thing that that um, I see a question here. 
Um, uh, look at for sauna. Look at infrared, infrared sauna, not Turkish steam or or the the. Right. the uh, Russian and, and I would add that uh, that infrared sauna must be well uh, protected from the EMF radiation that infrared saunas can create and there are one or two companies that actually can do that that have the technology to do that there's a question on IV ozone honestly speaking I don't know enough about I've never used IV ozone and I don't know enough about it to know and I again I always go to the medical literature to find out something Okay, I, I have to get an answer to this question. It's not my question, but I'm hung up on this question. Um, considering antibody tests, how do you know that the mycotoxin antibody exposure is not from diet? How do you, do you know that? And because, how do you determine that? Well, because this is body burden. It's not some, first of all, the amount you get in your diet is parts per billion. It's, it's, and I asked a scientist, tell me what the heck is a parts per billion. He says, take 10 football fields, cover them with one layer of, of uh, golf balls and remove one golf ball. That's a part mm -hmm. per billion. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that helps me visually because I'm a visual kind of a guy. So those things are excrete. We're exposed to not only mycotoxins, we're exposed to all kinds of carcinogens, viruses, bacteria all the time, and our immune system constantly fights this off. So when you start getting sick, it's because the immune system can no longer tolerate that level. And then you start forming antibodies to these, and you form, and you start forming these antibodies, and that that tells you what the body burden is. Got it. So in other words, the concentration, the density, the amount that's measured in parts per billion is way too low to have a, the toxic effect on the immune system right. you that wanna... would manifest as complex illness. And remember, this is very important. Antibodies mean pathology. Antibodies indicate a pathological condition that can be happening. You could be triggering cancer with DNA addicts. You could be triggering mm -hmm. autoimmunity with tissue binding, et cetera. Urine is no pathology and it's only metabolites. It's not mycotoxins. Gotcha. Thank you for that clarification. I've been dying to ask that question of you for many years and I'm glad I I'm glad I'm a, a panelist. <laughs> okay, um, does the lab, my micro lab, provide clinical consultation? I get asked all the time by clinicians, okay, I got the test, now what? What do I do? What does this mean? I take the time to talk to every one of them. I actually talk to them and I help them because they're helping people. And we as clinicians, you, I, the others, are doing their best to help their patients. I explain it, I go through it with them and I ask them about, you know, what's this patient like? You know, what, what are your thoughts? What are your, and then they, and then we have, sometimes it's an hour long. I don't care, I wanna help people. Well, I've personally experienced that from you and I'm very grateful. So thank you for offering this service. Um, there was a one random question that I thought was interesting. It was something about mycophenolic acid. Um, I believe that's a urine metabolite. Let me see if I can find that question. Um, it was something about, um, are you concerned about, obviously you're not, but I just, I just want you to, uh, uh, how to eliminate mycophenolic acid. Is that a problem or is that just a necessary metabolite that should be there anyway? First of all, um, if, if you measure penicillium toxin, which is a, a type of mycophenolic acid, that we know causes immune suppression. That's well established. So if a person comes in and Either they show you a report that there's penicillium mold in the home, but let's say they don't have a report and you get um, a, a level, an antibody level to mycophenolic acid, 
you've you've got a, you're you're dealing with a person that's immune suppressed. Got it. Okay. In urine, it is. I have. Show me something in the medical literature that says it, it has significance in human, not animals, humans. Okay. Thank you. That was a great clarification. Um, IVPC, IVALA, do you use those interventions in your protocols? No. Okay. Uh, and we already addressed the IV laser. Okay, many thanks. Lots of uh, comments. Okay. Um, okay, here's an interesting question. I don't, I don't know if you want to ask this to be restated, but when we talk about body burden, it sounds like we're talking about antibody levels. Are these direct measurements of the mycotoxins per se? The direct measures of the antibodies formed by that person's immune system to a particular or particular set of mycotoxins. I think there's an important question here about pregnancy. Yes. That you can answer. And let me tell you what happened. I had a pediatrician, a lady pediatrician, come and bring her 30-year-old daughter to me. The daughter had been married since she was 25 and been pregnant several times and lost each time the baby. Mm -hmm. And she says, I read, I, I was looking and looking and I read your papers. Could this be due to mycotoxins? So I went through this. My questionnaire is, is 17 pages long. Mm -hmm. so filled this out prior to coming see me. I looked at all of that and I said, well, you, you, you know, you run, you're in a company. Where, where do you work? I said, she says, well, I have, I'm the boss of my section. I have a corner office. I said, you know, is there any wetness uh, in, in that? Uh, sometimes you got to use words like that. Don't, don't say, is there any water leak? Well, then they think of a drip, drip. Is there any wetness around? She says, yes, a lot of times uh, when, I'm, when I know there's going to be rain over the weekends, I, I, I notice on Monday there's always a wet area right under my waste paper basket in that office. And I said, how big is your office? Well, it's just a normal office, not very big. Sure enough, we treated, we did antibody testing on her, treated her, but she was not pregnant. Later on, she got pregnant and she called her baby Andrea, you know, go figure. But the point is, is that, um, uh, and another doctor, an OB-GYN sent me a patient who was pregnant with twins and one of the twins died in utero and I tested her and sure enough, she had antibodies. Unfortunately, we can't use medication in those patients. Right. So, but I wanted to bring that up. Okay. And then uh, Dr. Gordon, hi. He has an interesting question, and, and I'll ask him to clarify. But his question is, uh, couldn't an antibody re response be a normal immune defense and not immune overwhelm? And uh, I... Okay. Um, I would... No, and really this is uh, immunology, and your, um, the immunology is, of, of the fact is, is that you are not, this is not a normal immune response when you have elevated levels uh, of antibodies to uh, anything for that matter. If you have high levels of antibodies to formaldehyde, uh, if you have high levels of antibodies to mycotoxins, if you have high level antibodies to uh, a virus, uh, you're, you're not talking about a normal, if you have high levels of hepatitis B virus, is that a normal body response? Heck no, that's disease, that's pathology. We're talking all about pathology. All right, and one final question, um, vertigo. Have you seen vertigo in mycotoxin exposed patients? Yes. We published a study on how these, in, in a group of adolescents, how they caused acoustic neuromas. Um, and this was, oh gosh, years ago, but um, 10, 15, more, 15, 18 years ago, we published that study. Um, and yes, it, it causes vertigo. And there, you actually should do a, there's a, a test you can do, and you, know, you can measure 
their sway is one way to do it. But right. if you have actual vertigo, you know, you, you do what ENTs, ENTs will show you what test it is, and you can get on the internet. They'll show you what test it is. They'll lay you back, and then they'll mm -hmm. throw you on one side, and then the other, and the patient's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Um, and, and you can use that test to determine for vertigo, but yes, it causes vertigo. Thank you, that was great. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. You've given us a precious hour. I, I'm very grateful. I hope this was helpful to uh, all of you out there. Please join us at EHS in April, the 2nd through the 5th in Scottsdale, Arizona, where it's nice and warm and dry. Operative word, dry. Unfortunately, we have dry molds in Arizona, as you probably know, but we like to say that, you know, we have dry molds versus wet molds, uh, where we'll be talking about um, immunotoxicity. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, you'll join us. And uh, again, if you want to uh, message Dr. Campbell directly, just go to the top of the chat. My, um, just move up to the top of the chat box and you'll see his email. Uh, a Campbell at mymycolab.com. Andrew, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. We'll see you all in April. Oh, it's been a pleasure. We've known each other a long time, and it's always a pleasure seeing you and doing this webinar with you. And I look forward to actually seeing you in person. Me too. All right. Take care. Be well, everyone. And I will see you in April.